physical interaction. I will be doing. Okay, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to everyone, uh, wherever you are. I know that uh, many of you are online and I'd also like to greet everyone present at the Talisidang room yeah, uh, in AHBS. Uh, we are indeed yeah, very honoured to receive um, Asha Ayub Graduate Business School's visiting professor, uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Kabir Hassan, who comes from University of New Orleans, USA. He is a professor of finance and he is here to give a talk, about one hour talk, yeah, on mapping the landscape of fintech in banking and finance, a bibliometric review. So um, the session is all yours, Professor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Can you hear me? Mute. Okay. So today I'm going to do a different kind of talk. Um, you probably heard about bibliometric um, analysis, uh, which is uh, becoming very popular for the last two or three years. There's so many bibliometric studies in different areas. So I also got into this bandwagon. So I thought that I'd do some of this. But one of the beauty of this bibliometric um, studies is that you know if you start a postgraduate program let's say doing a master's and the most difficult part or even phd the literature review part so this this technique actually helps you to become more efficient in collecting the the right papers to read the, trying to find the right gap in the literature so that you can do your own research so the context is the various financial institution sectors, including banks, non-bank financial institutions, stock markets, and cryptocurrency platforms are increasingly using fintech. Now, the fintech use has increased due to its ability to improve and automate financial services delivery, particularly after the global financial crisis of 2008. And fintech provides new business opportunities including the development of mobile applications with security features to reduce cost acquisition and save time and effort. The retail payment and banking sectors are key areas of fintech applications, while non-bank financial intermediaries match prospective borrowers and lenders through online platforms. So there are different online platforms like you know, I don't remember exactly, but uh, Lending Tree is one of them in the United States. It's a huge one. Then you bypass the intermediary, so you try to connect with the borrower directly. So there is a need to reveal the publication and citation trend of fintech literature in banking and finance to provide an in-depth knowledge to stakeholders and facilitate future research. So what we did, we have looked at 366 articles published in A star, A and B category journals of the ABDC journal quality list. And if you look at this ABDC, which is widely regarded in Asian subcontinent, including the United States, there was only two publications in 2016, and it became 136 in 2022 alone, which is about 76% increase of the publication. Now, there are two parts of the bibliometric analysis, data and methodology. One part is very easy because it's a computer software driven. But the second part, when you do content analysis or cluster analysis, that is where you have to use your brain. So, bibliometric data has been extracted from the Scopus database and it includes quality peer reviewed journals. And there has been a number of uh, papers that have used this. Um, Wave of Science, some of them have used Scopus, some of them use Global Google Scholar. So there is a preference for you know one research and the other research and so on. So just to give you an idea, the Google uh, Scholar gives you the largest number of articles, 
then Scopus it narrows it down and Weber science even narrows it down. So that's the way it goes. So, but here, what we have done, we have looked at only the ABDC journal. So there is Scopus, but they are categorized as A star, A and B. We did not go beyond it just in order to, because, uh, you know, the higher level, the journal is, you know, the, because the peer review process is very strict. So that's the way we have to. So here is just a snapshot. The total documents you looked at 366, number of sources, 146 different sources, period 2016 to 22, single author documents 55, multi-author documents 311. So these are the some statistics that usually, I mean, spun out by the program that they're using, okay? Any bibliometric program that will give you these statistics. So, we use a different method of literature review. In the past, it used to be, you know, you talk to your professor, professor say, read these 10 papers. So you go to the library, you read what time you're talking about. Right now, what you can do, there are SLR, there are meta-analysis. Meta-analysis used to be very popular at one time when I was a student. Now, bibliometric, because of the information technology improvement has become very important. So bibliometric analysis is an extension of LSLR, which is called systemic literature review that uses quantitative data, statistical analysis, and technology to measure the productivity, impact, measure themes, and collaborating networks in a specific domain. And it is a comprehensive method that measures the publications and research of research documents and books. And before visualization, the data is cleaned to match similar terms and improve the accuracy of the results. So there is a one new technique we are using this called page rank. So page statistics are used for the text size and network diagram to represent the relative importance of the publication irrespective of its total citations. So this is an equation that the program uses. So I don't want to bother you with this uh, equation part of it. So let's look at the performance analysis. It includes the descriptive measures of the published documents. It includes the annual trend in publication and citation, top most prominent documents, productive and prominent journals, organization, authors, and countries. And the number of publication explains the productivity while the total and average citations reveal. Oh, the prominence. So if you look at this picture, so this is gives you the store. Remember we choose the 216 to 222 now. Now, if you look at the same paper, you know, it will look different because 2023, a lot of papers came out and so on. So if you see there are some statistics on the top. So TP stands for total publication. TC stands for total citation. TCP is the total cited publication. And TC over TP is the average cited publication. So that gives you a sort of uh, like, look at the average TC over TP, TC over TCP. 2016 35.5 and if you go above one of the reason if you see the numbers are falling because the number of publications are increasing so it is a relative uh, measure so here if you look at more pictorially so total publication you know 2016 2022 is a top but if you look at um, tc uh, total citations are not really increasing that much okay Part of the reason can be explained, you know, when one paper comes in, everybody cites that paper, then, then the field becomes redundant, you know, or, you know, I mean, too much, too many papers going, which paper to cite and so on. So the table three um, shows the collaboration pattern of authors publishing articles on FinTech in banking and finance. So out of 360C publication, 55 are single authored only. So this is a very common trend because nowadays, you know, 50 years ago, our forefathers, you know, when they did their research, it was like 500 page long or 300 page long, everything they had to do on their own. But technology have increased, we, the, all the branches have become specialized. So you do not have all knowledge is one person. So we try to, you know, coordinate with each other too. So that's the reason the peer reviewed articles, the multiple peer reviewed articles is increasing that much. So if you look at one single author 55, 293, 
So majority of this article, about 31% are with three authors. So, and that the profession has accepted this as a new way of doing research and collaborating. So this is also given authors collaboration and respective citations in this figure. Now, this table four, the top product of prominent journals in FinTech literature is banking and finance. So what is the top? Now this gives you another new young scholar. Okay, if I want to search for a journal, which journal should I look at first for this specific? So from our analysis, bibliometric, it tells you the technological forecasting and social change are most productive and influential journal with 25 publication, 518 citations and 22 cited articles. The second one in this list is finance research letters, the third one journal of economics and business. Now, if you look at, so now, you know, if a professor tells you, where should I look at, you know, what are the journals? So these are the top um, journals in the field, which is published different aspect of FinTech in banking and finance. So you should look at, because when we were students, you know, back in 90s, it was a big real struggle really. So we had to need to brain, suck the brain of our professors. Hey, what journal should I look at? They would give a few, few. but nowadays, now if somebody wants to do a research, a PhD or masters can look at this, by the way, this paper is published already, Journal of International Review of Business and Finance. It's an A-level journal. So they can go and that cuts their time short, okay? We don't have to really wandering in the forest jungle, you know, what to do and so on. Now, once you have the most, and now you look for the, what are the prominent articles? You know, remember in our days when we used to say, okay, these are the five papers you must read. And the professor would say the same thing. So here are some of the most prominent um, authors and prominent articles. The number one is Gomber on the FinTech revolution, interpreting the forces of innovation, disruption, and transformation in financial services. And what is the journal name? Journal name is Journal of Management Information Systems. If you look at number five, Anjan Thakur, he's a very famous finance professor in the United States, and his article, FinTech and Banking, What Do We Know? It came out 2020, and Journal of Financial Intermediation. So this, I give you the list of 15 articles any student, PhD student, master student must read if somebody wants to do research in this area. And where the source is, how many, what year it was published, what is the total citation, and what is the citation per year, all are given. Now, most prominent authors, countries and organizations sometimes like to know who are the people doing the most of the work and where they locate. So in top, table six, we show the top productive prominent authors, countries, and organizations of 926 authors, 75 countries, and 873 organizations. Just think about it. If you did not have the technology and the papers are not published online, you would be really traveling like Ibn Battuta all over the world in search of knowledge and never ending your life, okay? So here, <laughs> you're talking about, you know, all this, uh, Big authors, you must know who are these people because you need to know them because if you write a paper in something, most likely one of them will be your reviewer, right? So if you cite their paper in the good book, it's oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> they just <laughs> little changes. So these are the 15 top authors that I mentioned. Now, what is their top country? Of course, the United States is the most productive country with 75 publications on FinTech followed by China and UK. So China is catching up. Yeah, China is big. The US, Germany, and UK, the most prominent countries in terms of total citation received with 1861, 1169, 959, respectively. Now, developed nations have more compared to developing nations because FinTech started from the developed nations, but it's slowly spilling over to the developing countries. Now, network analysis. So. We call this in Arabic wasta. You need to know each other. And it's very important in our culture, right? Whom you know is, is matters. Same thing in journal publication as well. Network analysis includes co-authorship analysis of authors, co-occurrence of author keywords, citation analysis of countries, 
post citation analysis of the journals, and bibliographic coupling of the documents published. So, Boss VR, you have to have a subscription to this, and I'm sure UITM is a big university. Uh, if you check, they probably have a subscription to it. Then you have GAPI software and statistical managers page, but they come as a as a uh, NDBO, uh, the name of the company, which when I did this work, so one of our co-author had access to this software because otherwise you cannot use it, right? Copyright violation and so on. Now, co-authorship analysis is used to study collaboration pattern of contributing authors globally. And the boss viewer helps you to perform the co-authorship analysis and Jelfi software is used to visualization along with the statistical measures like page rank. And what I was told by my students now, LinkedIn has become a very prominent source of connecting with people. They use the use by the professional people, not the, you know, my kids said that they don't use anymore the Facebook. It's use the, the old people and the younger ones. That was, they had the drifting apart from the Facebook use. I mean, you have to communicating with each other. So these are the note tells you uh, which way the connection is going. So you see Yarova, she is a professor in UK. So she is connected with all these people through their citation. So figure three shows collaboration panel authors. So 80 authors met the threshold of two publications and two citations, but only 11 shared the connections. So when you do this, because you cannot, you know, to reduce the size. So you have to self-impose parameter you have to put. Okay, how many citations we need have minimum in order to be in our analysis? So use two. Some people have probably five, depending on the field. But fintech is a new emerging field. So if you do it like five, this this sample becomes shrunk so that you cannot do any meaningful analysis. So Yaroba, and we have also a paper with Banna, is the first author. So there are connections in this area is happening. Now you can also look at whenever you write a paper. It's very common that you, common means is a must. You have to have a keyword and you have the JA classification. So the author's keyword, we also look at and try to connect how these key orders are connected with each other. So keywords co-occurrence analysis is used to identify the thematic similarity based on the actual element content of publications. Author's keywords are used in the study and identical keywords are merged. And the analysis reveals that fintech, financial inclusion, blockchain, crowdfunding, cryptocurrency, peer to person to person lending, and COVID 19, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and reactor are the most occurred keywords. And the prominent keywords are shadow banking, trust, reactor, fintech, sustainability. A regulatory sandbox, P2P lending, regulation, innovation, small and medium enterprises. So here in this table, it's not coming. So keywords I'm show sure there, you know, uh, fintech, financial inclusion, now showing blockchain, crowdfunding, cryptocurrency, peer-to-peer -peer lending, COVID-19, Artificial intelligence, machine learning, rec tech, China itself a keyword, innovation, financial services, banking, digital finance, big data, trust, entrepreneurial finance, regulation, financial regulation, financial literacy. So it tells you how many times it is occurring. Like for example, uh, FinTech 252 times. You have on the other side also have Bitcoin, robot, advisor, digitalization, financial stability, shadow banking. So this also helps you when you write your own paper, sometimes you struggle. What are the keywords I should use? That also helps you to pinpoint or focus which keyword to pick up or how to do it. So again, it tells you the network, how it's connected. As I said, the FinTech is a, why it's taking time? Okay, now it shows the so FinTech, you see the big circle there. So this is a mother keyword and the, all of the babies surrounding grandchildren all over the, on the map. Now citation analysis of countries. Now citation analysis helps find the linkages between two documents and determine the impact of research articles. So here, what you do, 
we use citation for countries and 33 out of 75 countries met the threshold limit of at least five citations. Now you may say that you did it uh, individual for two, why for country five? Well, country is a combination of individuals, right? So we look at five, and if you look at United States, it's still leading. So there are every other country, where is Malaysia? Vietnam has there, Indonesia has there. Malaysia should be there because it's, uh, you produce a lot of papers. Okay, the post citation analysis of the journal. So now journals are also connected with each other. Now, those who do are research active will find out if you submit a paper to a journal and if it gets just rejected, so the journal editor gives you a series of other related journals where you can send it. And this section provides a co citation letter 24 journals that have been cited at least 50 times. So, here, these are the journals. They are connected to each other, management size, International Journal of Bank Marketing, another one, Journal of Financial Economics, Journal of Business Research, Journal of Management Info Systems. They are connected with each other through a network system. Now, bibliographic coupling of documents, what is it? The bibliographic coupling helps find conceptual similarities in citing a document, including recently published research articles with fewer citations. So what it does, so build a coupling of documents. So these are the people, documents written. So if you say Bollard to 2021, Gumbar. So the bigger the size of this, uh, oh, it's not good. Okay, the bigger the size of this circle, that means this person is dominating or driving the other people. Like in the leader and follower type of relationship. Now, so far what I told you is very easy. Anybody can do it because it's just the use of a software. You have to know how to use the software, what parameter you have to press, so some control you have. Once you do this, now the most important part is for cluster analysis, where you have to download the data in Excel, then you have to do your intellectual capital starts here. So this section covers a cluster analysis based on bibliographic coupling of documents to reveal conceptual themes of each cluster. Now, table A shows the publication including each cluster, their total and average citations, cluster themes, topic cover, top cited papers of each published year based on the cluster analysis. So here we are talking about from our analysis. So we have pinpointed five clusters. That means this cluster one belongs to similar ideas and thematic uh, papers. So if you look at 2016, it started with because of database, one paper. Then if you look at 2022 cluster three one paper, 2021, so not each year has covered all the clusters. So let's look about the cluster one, okay? So cluster one is FinTech and financial services. What are the topics covered in this cluster? FinTech, financial inclusion, financial services, entrepreneur finance and digital transformation. And who are the authors again? These are the, so let's go to one study because you need to you know, I mean, narrow your focus. You cannot do everything, right? Because when you were talking about masters or PhD, the narrow focus is another guide. That's why you need a supervisor who can, you know, stars can guide you all the way. So, but this gives you this cluster. I need to read entry of fintech firms and competition in the retail payment market. Why this, which journal published it? Asia Pacific Journal of Financial Studies. So cluster one, cluster two, FinTech and crowdfunding, FinTech, crowdfunding, green bond, cryptocurrency, and blockchain. And who are the authors? Like for example, Lee and Shin, 2018, FinTech, ecosystem, business models, investment decision, and challenges. Just I'm giving you a snapshot uh, and you can, uh, get the paper from the internet, from the journal it was published, and you can read it in order to benefit from it. FinTech and financial industry is the third cluster. And what are the topics covered? FinTech, financial industry, outsourcing, shadow and trade finance. Now, these are the articles. Let's mention one article, Leon et al. 2017, nurturing a FinTech ecosystem the case of a youth microloan startup in China. Let's look at 
cluster number four. And what is that cluster? That cluster is FinTech and credit scoring. Now the FinTech, credit scoring, mobile money, technology adoption, and cybersecurity. Again, let me mention one paper came out 2020, Sinio and Osabute, unearthing antecedents to financial inclusion through FinTech innovation. It came out in a journal called Techno Innovation. And finally, the cluster number five, FinTech and lending. And what are the topics are covered in that uh, FinTech and lending? FinTech, shadow banking, marketplace lending, lending club, and peer-to-peer -peer lending. And peer-to-peer -peer lending is very pop. I mean, a lot of very influential paper is written in this area because huge amount of data is available. So let's look at, uh, let's move on. Or it is not moving. Oh, I got stuck. I will try to start. So. Sorry, uh, I'm just having technical difficulty moving my slides. I start and crazy. Oh, okay. we are back in action. Thank you. <laughs> done, done. So let me, uh, yeah, it's moving. So there is a time gap, you know, every time the slides goes. Okay. So the FinTech and financial services, let's put a little more. The cluster one includes 21 articles on FinTech, financial inclusion, financial services, entrepreneur finance, and digital transformation. So what these articles cover, the impact of FinTech on competition in retail payments sector, the effects of regulatory restrictions on traditional banks and the growth of shadow banks, the short and long-term effects of acquiring fintech companies, the impact of fintech on the financial services industry, and the factors affecting customer experience and loyalty intentions in the fintech sector. If you look at fin cluster two, fintech and crowdfunding, it contains 12 articles with 936 citations on topics such as fintech, crowdfunding, green bond, cryptocurrency, and blockchain. So these articles cover various topics, such as the impact of FinTech on the market, the formation of FinTech startups, and the importance of AI, robotic stocks, and green bonds in portfolio diversification. It suggests that traditional stocks and FinTech are poor hedging options for a single portfolio, and that investing in long-term assets can reduce risk. Gold, oil, and green bonds are valuable as hedge compared to other assets. The cluster three is the FinTech and financial industry. It contains 12 articles with 1,013 citations from the Scopus and what are the key findings? Digital technology increases financial inclusion. We're not surprised, right? More people have access. FinTech innovation mapping evaluates changes in financial services sectors. Blockchain implementation is through affordance actualization theory. You know, blockchain as a, uh, as a tool is a good idea, but the question is, when you talk about the people, the poor people or the broad appeal of this thing has not happened. So the, it will happen slowly when the younger generation getting used to technology and technology also penetrates in different sectors of the society. Knowledge hiding in blockchain may affect knowledge sharing Decentralization finance may alter contemporary finance organization. Blockchain implementation in banking business sectors has reliable, valid, and one-dimensional benefits. And fintech development can aid in lowering greenhouse gas emissions. 
Number four, FinTech and credit scoring. Here, 10 articles with 429 citations. And what are these articles examined? They examine various factors that affect the adoption of FinTech and mobile money services, including data security, customer trust, user design interface, performance expectancy, and effort expectancy. One of this area I think very prominent and very important is called cybersecurity. You know, this is the entire field is developing. Your life is no longer private anymore. I know what you're doing in the morning, what you have taken in the sugar, how many spoons and so on. Because, no, seriously. <laughs> this is the way, it is. all the data are we are sharing in directly into the uh, Facebook and they're collecting our data. Cluster 5 has 10 articles with 450 citations on fintech, shadow banking, marketplace lending, lending club, and peer-to-peer -peer lending. And what are the key findings? Fintech consumer lending reaches underserved areas. That's true, because some of the, like, um, in Bangladesh, you know, there are now go the different types of technology that in, the, in MP, in Kenya, and in Malaysia also, like I came here with Grab, oh, that's, that was wonderful. But you used to have uh, uh, Uber, but you kick Uber out, right? They're not behaving. So you have your, <laughs> your, your, is it a Malaysian version of Grab or is it an international? Singapore based, okay. FinTech has significant effects on the credit for SMEs and large banks. FinTech can replace the need for more small banks. Now, here comes, the important piece, again, this is where we had to really, um, uh, you know, shake our head, you know, bring our heads together so that what will be the future research agenda in this area. This is where you can take some take home message. The overall analysis reveals that several areas need more retention in literature on FinTech and banking finance. While the previous section dealt with topics most frequently covered in the past literature, this section provides areas open to future researchers and future research needs to explore these topics to provide more insights on fintech in banking and finance. We identify some interesting research areas for future research agendas on fintech. So what are those things? You see, oh, beautiful picture is coming. Excuse, okay. So we, <laughs> we have pinpointed all these areas, sub areas that future research can be done. So let me go through this. Don't worry, I'm coming to an end. 10, 14 minutes more, okay? So the first one is FinTech and post-COVID era. COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on banking and finance globally. It's not only that. We also have changed, right? Before pandemic, you know, online class was few and far between. Now this has become a norm. But it also helped us to uh, make a bridge between, you know, those who can come and cannot come. But I'm an old fashioned person. I like to see people, you know, dance in front of the people. So I still am having trouble adjusting, but it does help me. Uh, so I, I finally I'm teaching an online class asynchronous. I never see them. You know, all of my video lectures are given. They come and take, uh, you know, uh, their exams and their assignment is submit. Occasionally I show my face two or three times, but that doesn't make me, you know, a robot can do it, right? So what, what is my, <laughs> uh, I mean, value addition into this process, except the creating the documents, right? So we have MTHly examined the factors boosting the intention to use FinTech in the post COVID era. And I have a paper, Hassan, exam how FinTech can be used in handling post-COVID challenges for Islamic finance and banking. Banna and Alam, one of my co-authors, examined if digital financial inclusion can maintain banking stability in Asian countries with implication for the post-COVID era due to Western sanctions during the Russian Ukraine war right now, self-reliant digital monetary system have become important for economies worldwide. And future research should focus on the role of fintech during the post-crisis period. Yes, during the crisis period, during this wonderful, we can still communicate with each other. I could even pray Juma, you know, e Juma, you know, the, 
there is a fatwa came out during this thing, so you can stay at your home and the Imam will do mosque and put Facebook and follow the Imam and do it in Jumma. <laughs> Seriously. And uh, there was a fatwa came. By the way, they are all Sharia scholars. Their background is Sharia. Even the lawyer right now, so they know what I'm talking about. FinTech and sustainable finance. FinTech is expected to significant contribute to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. This has become a big thing. I'm sure Rashad Abdul School of Business and every the whole university, how your program is related to SDG. What SDG is covering? You have to do this mapping for your, you know, accreditation purpose and selling your uh, program to other parties. A few recent studies argue that FinTech contributes to financial inclusion by reducing payment costs and mobilizing domestic savings. And FinTech ecosystem paves the way to achieving sustainable financial goals and it indicates future research question in this direction. So, if you read this article by Goldberg Sanjay's 2021, he also give very specific research that can be addressed. Number three, FinTech and unemployment entrepreneurship in financial sector. So, it's a big issue in Malaysia, I know. The introduction of technology is actually to reduce the employment human resource. But many people say it's going to reduce on one side, but it's going to create on the other side. Our fintech is argued to reduce and through financial inclusion. At the same time, it is also expected to increase opportunity for self-employment and empower women entrepreneurs. No, a mother with a small child can stay at home and can do their business. Now, while exploring the impact of digital technology on labor product, uh, argue that digital development is favorable for employment expansion. So there are two, you know, these. Uh, Groups, one group is saying it's going to reduce, the other groups know it's going to create more opportunities. I tend to believe that it's going to be, of course, it's going to reduce some form uh, of the, uh, the labor. So actually, the new definition of labor market is task-based. Now, for example, even the class that we teach, there are certain classes you really don't need to tell, like the six taxonomy of knowledge, the knowledge facts, the students can do, upload the materials, they can learn it. But the most difficult part, the interaction that you come to the classroom. So there can be a good marriage between these two techniques. So you can make it, in that sense, really hybrid one. Uh, FinTech Islamic Finance, of course, you know, there are different, like in, in, in Malaysia is a laboratory, zakat collection, you know, the technology is being used, zakat distribution. You have B40 and above and below. During this pandemic, the government used those technology using different financial, Islamic financial product to reach to the people. Now, FinTech and terrorism. There's another issue and financial crime. FinTech is expected to eliminate terror funding, money laundering, and other financial crimes. Again, it depends whose definition is this, right? Terrorism is a very relative concept. While discuss how FinTech applications can be prone to fraud, and machine learning can play a significant role in fraud detection. Um, so this article by Phillips provides for how the introduction of fintech has leveled the risk of terror funding across jurisdiction. So again, very touchy, politically sensitive issue, these things, terrorism, and talk about who is a freedom fighter and who is a terrorist, right? Number six, fintech and Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robot advisory. With the fintech revolution in the financial markets, the adoption of robot advisory services and investor attention toward robotic and AI stocks has been examined in few studies. So concomitantly, the ML or the machine learning approach to fintech can empower fraud detection in fintech-based applications. Believe it or not, my daughter has started a startup with machine learning, and she has a degree in neurobiology. Only God knows how she does it. And she got $15 million VC funding already. So she must be doing something good. <laughs> so these kids, you know, the younger generation, they can navigate in different areas. My generation, finance, finance. You cannot go outside of finance. <laughs> Number seven, FinTech and regulations for ethics, privacy, and security. With the evolution of the new payment system, Potential systemic risks are expected to increase, such warranting the need for adhering to international standards and imposing additional regulatory requirements. 
Now, recent research have argued that the absence of regulatory requirements and security threats related to data privacy drive the consumer's intent to adopt fintech applications. Ethics is very important. Ethical issues concerned with the increase in fintech are also important. Now, again, this is a subjective matter as well. What is ethics? How do you define ethics? And from what context you're defining ethics? So, there are a lot of things can be done from this perspective, from, you know, law perspective, economics perspective, finance perspective. Number eight, fintech and growth of small and medium enterprises. The introduction of fintech application aspect to facilitate the growth of SMEs is very important. I think in fintech can really help these small businesses. Fintech has strengthened the SMEs in ASEAN countries during the COVID-19. At the same time, fintech allows financial system while empowering credit access to SMEs and improving their investment efficiency. SMEs lack robust financial management and fintech with the significant growth of fintech platforms, further research should empower the stakeholders by providing insights into how the solutions improve the functioning of SMEs, particularly in emerging nations. Number nine, fintech and retail payment system. It has proven to be very effective in many countries. Few studies have explored the development of new retail payment system from different countries' perspective. Competition in the retail payment system is significantly increasing with the evolution of the fintech industry. Now, Yoon and John, 2019, very important paper analyzed the impact of the fraud liability regime on anti-fraud investment in the fintech payment scheme while BGO 2022 explored the central bank's experience in extending the access of real-time gross settlement systems to retail payment service providers other than the commercial banks. Right now, we are talking about central bank digital currency. We are talking about digital banking. We are talking about open banking. We are talking about new banking. Number 10, fintech and adoption in developing nations. That's more important to developing countries and 57 OIC Muslim kind of most of are developing. So the literature of fintech and banking finance presents 75 countries, but the number of papers from developing nations is significantly low compared to developed nations. Some literature explores the intention to adopt fintech in developing nations, and there is more research needed to explore what can be done to help them to the fintech process to financial inclusion and all of those things. So I'm coming to the final few slides. So what we have done in this paper, again, this paper has been published in 2022. You can Google search it and can download and read it. A bibliometric analysis of 360 articles of FinTech in the Scopus database we conducted. Annual publication increased from two in 2016 to 136 in 2022. 76% of the publication have been cited at least once and 20% of publications have received at least 20 citations. And 85% of publications are collaborative outcome of two or more authors, with the most prominent article being Gomber et al. 2018. And the most important journal is Technological Forecasting and Social Change, and the most productive country, the United States of America, where I live. The most productive and prominent authors are Jiang Ye and Jack Tiani and ECGI Belgium is the most prominent organization. The most common author keywords are FinTech, financial inclusion, blockchain, crowdfunding, and cryptocurrency. And the most prominent keywords are shadow banking, trust, rack tech, FinTech, sustainability, regulatory sandbox, and peer-to-peer -peer lending. We analyze five different clusters and focus on topics such as credit scoring, financial industry crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending, retail payment, and cryptocurrency. And implications for future research in connection with FinTech are also provided in each section and also in a separate section. And that basically concludes my presentation and thank you very much. And I will be happy to take any question if you have. Thank you, Prof. Kabir, yeah, for a comprehensive overview of fintech bibliometric analysis. Uh, your insights into the evolving trend and key research areas are very meaningful and truly enlightening. 
Uh, so I would like to welcome the audience here yeah, to ask Prof Kabir any questions that you may have with regard to the talk that he delivered just now. Please feel free to ask. Everybody probably is tired after you know Friday Juma prayer and and lots of nasi. They're nasty. <laughs> <More of, laughs> because you know, like Malaysians, you also eat a lot of rice in Bangladesh. We eat rice and fish, but you eat rice and <laughs> you can also type your question in the chat box. How many are presented this? So uh... if I'm not mistaken, about 35 to 40, yeah. So these are all students or we we have a few lecturers there i could see some names yeah. there lecturers. lecturers and students oh. uh, okay i need to get at least one question from lecturer one question for doctor and one question for masters otherwise i'll not let you go and i'm going to hold up your two professors here we have a lecturer there dr amirul afif oh amirul is there hey amirul how are you man i see you on the facebook <laughs> oh yeah, he follows you on Facebook. Anything? We also have Professor Sharifa Faiga from AAGBS who has just joined us. She recently got promoted to professor. Oh really? She has been okay. The, okay, we talked about this slide. She was stuck somewhere, right? How to do that? And she is also the your Sharia scholar, right? She sits in very Sharia boards. Yeah. How are you? Congratulations. Sorry, is my Nasi Gorang. <laughs> no, I don't see her anymore. In the oh, there's one question. Okay. Uh, does AI a threat to feedback? AI is a threat to feedback. Yes, of course, you know, AI, the artificial intelligence, the chart GPT, change everything, like 2022 November. You know, you can even, I create you, our, our, you know, Arlena, I mean, okay, who you are and so on, I can write a complete essay on you. You know, this is, I'm little, getting a little bit from two angles. You know, there's Yuval Hariri. Yuval is a Israeli author. And he has been giving a lot of influential talk how this artificial intelligence is taking life from us. They can create, recreate anything they want. And the boys, even you, you probably are making a presentation or me making a presentation. Actually, well, I'm not making a presentation. It can even create that level. So yes, artificial intelligence, but you know what is happening we really need to again you know, i was listening what is happening in gaza right now this merciless cleaning and israeli idf using artificial intelligence to have called this uh, targeted killing how to maximize assassination they call this uh, uh, capital or target so and they're using the AI tool in order to pinpoint. So in the past, what happened, the Israeli different forces, they were a little bit merciful. So that I want to attack this building. So they will tell that you have to evacuate, given enough time. But right now they have come up with, it came out in Israeli media, that let's say one terrorist is there, there are 50 other people, in order to get this one terrorist before, they will kill, they will not, say who else is there uh, who else is living there and how many lives will be killed and they they talk about this oh we are minimizing this killing all these people but one single innocent people is important whether it's israeli whether it's a jewish or it's a palestinian and they are using ai technology tool in order to target those people so sister or whoever they ask the question yes ai is defining this fintech and this is the new boy in the in the in the in the in the courtyard right now 
Okay, there is one more question from the audience. How are fintech companies leveraging blockchain technology to enhance the security and efficiency of cross-border transactions? And what impact does this have on traditional banking systems? Big impact. Let me tell you, I'm trying to go to perform Umrah, uh, you know, in December with my wife. So I asked my, you know, I mean, trying to use my American Citibank MasterCard. So every time, because I'm in Malaysia, someone pinpoint I'm in Malaysia trying to make a payment from here. So you're talking about the technology. Blockchain is one technology, right? There are many other technologies coming up that you do not know. But blockchain, we know because you have this, you know, Bitcoin. You know, but there are other technologies developing which are faster than Bitcoin. In the advance of the mathematical development helps too, because all of these mathematical solutions are a problem. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it's going to make it easy and it's going to make it difficult. But the question is, I do not want to go that far. Like that's why Maybank, I was told Maybank or CMB stop sending money. To America because every time it sends money cross border, it goes through so many. So, one time, you know, I was expecting a payment, it like it took a month and later on, you know, after a series of inquiry, then they, they show that look, we are doing our job. There are 256 pages of different iteration it has to go through. So, now the question is who is controlling this technology, right? So, let's say um, uh, United States and Malaysia are not in good terms. They're going to block it right now. What is happening between the United States and and the Russia? So swift technology, but Russia has created their own other technology to bypass it. So yes, we did this better technology blockchain, helpful, but ultimately it is the national or the political decision how you want to make it useful for everyone. Now let's say for some reason. One country is no longer a friend with another country. They used to be friends. There has to be some international monitoring or, or the controlling mechanism that even to become enemies, that, that right that I have should not be curtailed. Right now, you know, the SWIFT is a good example. So if you come up with a technology, you have to make it universal. So the answer is yes, there are other technologies better than blockchain as well which will be very helpful. Yes, Salaam Alaikum, dear Prof. Oh, Salaam Alaikum. Oh, <laughs> there you oh. Welcome is... to the AGBS, Prof. Yes, so you are... Yeah. Okay, uh, sorry for not being able to join you the, uh, today. I got appointment outside at the hospital. Okay. No, that's not an excuse. You need to take us for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> inshallah, we will meet next week. Inshallah. No nasi. Want to eat more than nasi? Okay, okay. I, I just, I, I just have uh, one question, Prof. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, regarding your opinion, because Malaysia now we start to have a digital bank. So, uh, what do you think in terms of the future of employment uh, by having digital bank? You know, of course, there will be physical, uh, you know, that's the point I'm trying to grapple myself, to be honest with you. So there is a um, gentleman uh, at University of Chicago. Uh, he's a Turkish uh, guy, I forgot his name. So he's trying to nowadays, the, how you define labor. Labor is just one piece or labor, they're trying to define the task based. So of course, this technology or AI or fintech is going to reduce or digital banking, the example that you're giving. Yeah. It's going to reduce employment in certain part, but mm -hmm. it's going to reduce employment in other parts. You okay. know, you see, uh, people in the front desk, but the people are moving in the back, back end of the uh, market because it's going to create more uh, employment in that sense. Now, the question is, of course, it's going to create or gravitate people towards technology use. So there will be more demand for in the short term, those who are IT background, computer science. So that's going to happen. Uh, speaking about digital banking system, mm -hmm. to understand this whole process, because recently Bangladesh also gave license to digital banking. Mm -hmm. And yes, Malaysia also has given license to digital banking as well. Yes, five banks. 
five, five of them. So yes. I have to, I'm still a student. I'm trying to understand this process. Uh, now, how is going to be regulated? Of course, transaction cost will be lower and digital banking, do I understand it has to be totally, you know, virtual. Yeah. Um, it has to have an office to manage the technology, the back end yeah. of the office uh, is supposed to increase financial inclusion. But of course, you do not need that many people like a commercial or traditional brick and mortar bank. So yeah. I'm learning. Uh, I'm not against it. I'm sure the regulators have given license. There's a reason they have studied it very comprehensively, but I have not done that comprehensive study or analysis of digital banking. So, uh, in your opinion, in what way we are actually um, can prepare our student for that uh, development? One media, say it again. Uh, in what way we, uh, the lecturers, uh, should prepare our students for that de development of having the digital banks? Okay, they, so they have to give it course or some sort of few lectures on digital banking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Send the question. Okay, there's another question on the uh, chat box. So thank you, Prof. I'm Daniel from Rajar FinTech, also a student from Ashraya Graduate School of Business, currently doing research on FinTech. My question is, the developing nations are more prone to use FinTech and it's increasingly year on year as compared to developed countries from a paper published by Arnesting recently. May I know why is this happening from your experience? Aside from this, may I know how can I get this recording of the video from Arshad I graduate school of business? Let me start with the easy part. So you need to contact Arlena and she has all the control of this. Okay. We are going to put it up on the AGS YouTube. Okay, it will be on A G A G S B YouTube channel. Okay. So you can hear it. Second one, you are you know, when you talk about the growth, you know the growth in mathematics. So you have a small base, the growth rate is very high. So the Western countries already have gone to the semi-maturity maturity level. So the growth rate is not showing up, but there are more and more technology coming in Western countries and developing countries. Since the developing countries started with the small, so even they get four or five, the growth rate is showing very high. So this is the relatively speaking, it doesn't mean that developing countries are catching up with the developed countries. It will be years to go before they can do this. So what honestly I said is correct mathematically is the mathematic explains this small base growth rate is high. You have a big base growth rate is low. Okay, let me see. Is there any other? There is one. Okay. Samsung Zakaria question from. Some may wonder whether some fintech solutions are compatible with Islamic principles since the rate question regarding legitimacy, particular technology, financial instruments, accord. technology is Sharia neutral. That's what I understand. How we use this, that's what the Sharia scholars have to come and give us guidance. I don't think that so far that Bitcoin that uses, you know, blockchain technology, no Sharia scholar has said anything against it. But what is produced Bitcoin, whether it fulfills the characteristics of money, mal. So there has been a number of papers, including one of ours, that we try to show what is the Sharia perspective of it. Some Sharia scholars say that if it is done properly, is some sort of asset based, then it can be Sharia compliant. The base question is anything when you define money, the money has to be universally acceptable. It will be fluid. Now, I was told that if you want to buy a pizza with a blockchain or Bitcoin, the price that you pay is much higher than what is in the market and the delivery time is much higher. I mean, that's what somewhere I read. In reality, I do not know. I never bought anything with Bitcoin. You probably know and whether the Bitcoin is allowed as a legal tender in Malaysia. I do not know it either, but in the United States, we don't you know the big companies uh, Apple or somebody else, you know, started then and stopped doing it. Even uh, what's the guy, the Tesla guy, uh, the ex Elon Musk, and then he stopped doing that. So it is a area very rare for research. 
for the Sharia scholars, they have to delve into this thing. Okay, so that was the question. Is there any other question? No. Okay. So there are no more questions. Um, let's wrap up yeah, our discussion on FinTech Bibliometric Analysis. Uh, on behalf of uh, Arsha Ayub Graduate Business School, I'd like to thank our speaker, Professor Kabir Hassan, and participants for their contribution and engagement in this session. Uh, let's continue to explore innovative approaches in the dynamic landscape of fintech research. Uh, if you have further questions or insights, feel free to connect with our speaker, Professor Kabir Hassan. Um, can they connect with you um, through Anytime. email or anything? Uh, yeah, so you can look up um, information, uh, contact, um, email uh, address and so on of Prof Kabir Hassan on the internet because it's very popular. So <laughs> you can just type his name, and, you know, you will get his details from there. Okay, so um, I would also like to welcome everyone to join our other session, which is going to be tomorrow. Okay, I know it's a Saturday, but it's in the morning, okay? So you are still fresh, okay? Uh, let's start your weekend right, okay? <laughs> so um, we have a talk on systematic literature review of risk in the Islamic banking system by Professor Kabir Hassan, and it will begin at 10, 10 in the morning. Okay, so if you look at the poster, the poster said 9 o'clock, but... Um, uh, Prof. Uh, Kabir Hassan wants to start at 10 o'clock, so okay, we have to nine, I... one more hour. <laughs> yeah, I can start at 9 too, but which way you advertise at 9 o'clock? I think we prefer 9 because I think we no, want That's fine. See, okay? Oh, that's fine. Right, so we'll begin at 9 okay. tomorrow, eh? So we'll nine finish at yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I thought that, you know, they sleep late on Saturday. Oh, okay. okay. No, no, I'm fine. Okay, so okay. we will see each other again at 9 a.m. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Salam. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Perfect.